Okay, awesome. So thanks everybody for coming to our panel on preparing for grad school interviews. Um, this is hosted by the Engineering Biology Research Consortium's Student and Postdoc Association. More about that at the end of the session. Um, so I'm Ross, I'm a postdoc in Peter Zanstra's lab at the University of British Columbia. Um, and I'm gonna allow each of our panelists here to introduce themselves and say something um, about their experience with grad interviews, either on the side of being a student or a professor. So why don't we just go left to right here, starting with Katie. Hi, uh, I'm Katie Galloway. I'm an assistant professor uh, in the Department of Chemical Engineering um, at MIT. And so my experience with interviewing is um, I do online, virtual, like Zoom interviews for uh, my program. Um, and then I do in-person interviews for computational and systems biology. And they're a lot of fun. And the thing that makes them a lot of fun is um, when I get to talk to students who are very excited um, about research that are very curious and that comes across in the interview. So that's what makes it fun for me. I'm Kellen Plesha. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Oregon in the Knight campus. Um, so I would say I, I do a very large mixture of interviews simply because I'm involved with a, and I recruit from a bunch of different programs. So um, some are interviews for direct admit straight to the lab. Some are interviews for admitting to a program that goes through a rotation system. Um, and a lot of the interviews, I would say at this point, at least the initial interviews are um, virtual, which we typically then, uh, at least our lab for the direct candidates, invite to give uh, a seminar, um, usually virtually, to the entire lab. Um, and then others, usually for the programs, for the rotation programs, are often in person. Um, and yeah, I think it's just, it's super awesome to see you know, what every, all the ideas and uh, what everybody's excited about. And there's a lot of enthusiasm. And I think there, it's just a really fun process. Um, so I'm Caitlin Daly. I am a research instructor at the University of Nebraska Medical Center in the Epley Institute for Research in Cancer, um, and specifically the Fred and Pamela Buffett Cancer Center. Um, a research instructor here is a junior faculty position. So I am progressing towards assistant professor. Um, and I offer perspective from uh, research at more of a medical institution um, and from a graduate only institution. Um, and then my lived experience, I offer perspective from crossing the poverty line um, and um, that sort of experience of interviewing myself. Great, thanks. Um, we'll go next. So as I mentioned, I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the University of British Columbia. Um, I did my grad interviews, uh, who knows how many years ago, 2014, 2013, something like that. We don't count years anymore. So um, yeah, I, I have that perspective as a student, but I've also given a lot of advice to people that are applying to grad school. And we've been doing these sorts of uh, panels and sessions for a couple of years now. So hopefully I can offer some insight there. Um, and I'll hand it over to Ice. Nice to meet you, everyone. My name is Ice. My full name is Chung Pisit Keti Sebi. So um, it's a Thai name, and I'm originally from Thailand. Um, so I'm gonna I'm I'm here to give a perspective of like maybe an international student, or like if you any of you who are in the US right now want to apply to the school outside of the US, then I can probably like talk a little bit about that as well. Um, yeah, it's probably like around five plus years ago that I did the um, the sort of interview. Um, and it could be a little bit different um, from here in the U.S. system or somewhere else outside of the U.S. Now, jump to Andrea. Hi, hey, everybody. I'm Andrea Garza. Um, I just recently defended uh, at Rice University. So, yay. But um, so I can give more of the perspective um, from somebody that probably didn't have that much undergrad research experience or really a lot of idea about what synthetic biology was even meant to be about. Um, I came in not even knowing that it was a topic you could research. Um, and then also um, I was involved in my school's student government slash student association. And so um, more of the grad student side of the interview process uh, things, yeah. Okay, perfect. 
Well, thanks everyone. Um, so I'm gonna shut off the screen share so we can be in normal panel mode. Um, okay, so the first question I have is for the professors among us. Um, and the question is, you already, you already mentioned a little bit about the different kind of interviews that go on and you can expound upon that a little bit. But most of the question is, what are you looking for in students that you interview, whether it's for direct admits or for like a, 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 more, a more rotation structure? And if that's different, you know, please feel free to elaborate. I, I guess I can start. So, um, so there's a number of factors, I think, um, you know, often, you know, each lab often has a very specific set <clears throat> of skills that you know, are needed to to carry out grad school work. And so rather than, you know, trying to find somebody that has, you know, that exact same matching set of skills, which is usually pretty rare, you try to look for indicators that suggest that the person is able to pick up and integrate new knowledge and skills relatively quickly. Um, so that's kind of an important aspect. Another aspect I would say is um, if the person has, you know, really looked at what you've been doing, knows roughly about your research. And especially there's, you know, a very small subset of candidates that I would say uh, reach out and they have their own ideas. So I think if they have their own ideas, that's already meant that, you know, they've been able to kind of integrate the knowledge of what you've been working on and really try to push the boundary forward, which is, you know, essentially the idea of, of a PhD. And I think the last little point I'll cover is about enthusiasm, um, you know, it can be a long journey with a lot of failures. And so you really need to see that someone has the kind of, I think, enthusiasm that is gonna be able to keep them really going when, you know, experiment number 20 has failed and there's no results and et cetera, et cetera. So I think it's a combination. And of course there's many other things, but those are just some of a small subset of things that I know I'd look at. Um, I can go, uh, add my perspective too. Um, in, in the Department of Chemical Engineering, we're really looking for chemical engineers. Um, so that's, that's one criteria um, that's uh, kind of unique uh, in that we, um, because our classes, our, our incoming classes, um, there's an expectation that their the students will be able to master the grad level uh, material. Um, and so uh, for students who don't have background in chemical engineering, I normally tell them go to bioengineering <laughs> or CSB, um, because the chemi core is is pretty intense at the grad level, um, especially if you don't have a background in it. If you have like a really strong mathematics, um, you can be okay, but it's still a lot to learn. Um, and I guess what I'm looking for in the in in the interviews is again um, a reflection that that people have had research experiences um, or, or some sort of experience where they where they wrestled through. Um, pro problems normally in projects or something like that that's a little bit more long term and an opportunity to reflect and think about you know what they're doing why they were doing it and why that's leading them to grad school I think having a compelling reason to go is important because you can do a lot in your 20s <laughs> and so my question is why do you want to toil away in lab um, when you could be making stacks of cash at BCG um, and uh, I mean that's not an option for everybody um, but it, it is an option for a lot of people. So oh, a lot of engineers, that's, that's a lot of our undergrads go and do that. Um, and what I find the answer for a lot of people who do choose to go to graduate school, like they're very curious, they want to keep learning. Um, they're very excited about that potential. And, um, and they've, they've counted the cost. They recognize that they're not going to make as much money I, in, you know, in going to a research career as they would if they went into consulting. And that knowledge is important to me that they know and have considered that. <laughs> so that's what I'll say. Awesome, thanks both. Um, so maybe now from like the student perspective, um, starting with the, the trainees or, or recent not trainees anymore here, what was sort of your approach to the interview process when you went into it? Yes, I'll answer first. I mean, of course it can be very scary and there's a lot of uh, advice out there that can seem a little bit contradicting, but I think one of the things that I um, did going into it, and I would still, if I had to go back, do again, is like you want to impress, but you still want to be genuine about it. 
because I know sometimes it can feel kind of like, oh, well, I'm gonna like, kind of like a resume. You're bragging about yourself. You're showing off your good qualities. You're trying to um, get the interviewers to be interested in you. But it, at the same time, if you push it a little bit too hard, it can come off as um, it, unauthentic. And the other thing to kind of consider with these interviews sometimes is that if you do end up choosing to go to this school and you do end up getting an acceptance letter from the school, the people that are interviewing with you, whether that's other people in the same cohort that got invited during interview weekend or in a call, um, but even the professors or grad students, postdocs that you meet at the place you're interviewing at, these people, you're going to see them in the next five you know, to eight years or however long. And so it's um, still important to show your best face, but at the same time, recognize that it's also a place you're going to be there in the future. And so you want to be genuine. You want to be friendly. You know, you want to start to look for uh, like things where you can see yourself either being there in the lab or being there in that city or in that space. Yeah. Yeah, I'm at kind of a unique position because I think I'm kind of halfway between my interviews myself and I'm onboarding for my lab now too. So it's um, what am I looking for versus what I did was, you know, to come back to what Andrea was saying is your your authenticity really matters. And I can see that in interviews. Um, and I want to know who you are because that matters to me almost more than your qualifications or at least equal with your qualifications is are you going to be a good fit in my lab with your personality and, and more so with your career goals too? Um, can I help you get to where you want to go? Um, and I think that's really important when you're interviewing to remember too, is that it goes both ways. Um, and you really need to consider what do I want out of this career to go back to what Dr. Galloway was saying and Katie was saying, um, can this lab get you to that career? Where are people going in that lab? Is it worth the time in academia um, and all of the hits that you're going to take inevitably along the way um, to get to that goal? Do you have the why? Do you have the purpose um, that will give you the grit and the resilience to make it through the program and the burning, flaming, moving hoops that are along the way? Because it's never the science. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting place to be. I think everyone has answered like all the great advices already. Um, one last thing I would like to add is like, you know, like you want to show um, what kind of student you are as well, because like keep in mind that you are applying for a student position, not a job position. So you don't have to be perfect. And, you know, I would rather, you know, trying to say something like I really want to learn about this not saying something like, I'm very good at this and I'm going to be perfect fit for your lab right away. Like when the people in the lab knows for sure that like it takes up to two to three years to master something like that. <laughs> if, if you are like, you know, come straight from undergrad saying that you're a perfect fit because you're a, a master, then that sounds like you don't know about that yet. So so like it, it could be, it could feel like that, but like, you know, trying to frame it like you want to learn more will always be beneficial. Like show them that you know about it and you are ready to learn more about it. Yeah, I'll add a couple of things. I found the interviews to be pretty fun. I, I was pretty stressed about them when I first went in and uh, it, it always, they, they seem to be more conversational to me, I guess. I thought it would be a bit of quizzing on like what I had done and like exactly what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. But it ended up being a lot of time for me to ask professors like what their vision was, where they were going, what they did. Because um, you can look at things on people's websites, you can look at a couple of papers, right? But that's usually like years, years behind what they're currently doing, very far behind where they want to go. And so use the opportunity just to be curious and to ask where things are going and, and to find yourself getting excited about something or other. Like for me, when I went in, um, to add a little bit more context, I wasn't fully decided on even the subfield. Like I wanted to do bioengineering, but I was thinking, you know, do I want to do neuroengineering? Do I want to do some like hardcore systems biology, computational work? Do I want to be a synthetic biologist? And I ended up going towards synthetic biology because I found that to be the most exciting when I was sort of going through the interviews and learning more and more and more 
um, about things. And it wasn't just at the interviews, it was also rotations. So if you have a rotation program that you're applying for, you know, you can also use that time to kind of get yourself out there and, and explore some different topics. But yeah, just be curious. I really like um, that Andrea said that. And I think some of the other, uh, I think Katie mentioned it as well. It's going to pay dividends for you throughout the interview process. Any more um, inputs here before I go on to the next question? Okay, sounds good. So next question, when you were interviewing, what was something unexpected that you came across? What, what should be the unexpected thing that our uh, participants here should expect? I can start off again. Um, one of the things that now I realize has maybe more impact, but it, of course it depends on the program, but if you have an interview or a visit where um, you're interacting with grad students, like usually sometimes they'll do, you'll get to have a dinner with grad students or there's going to be a happy hour or something like that. That's technically part of the interview in some instances. So um, one of the things that's might be unexpected is thinking of that as, oh, okay, I can kind of let loose. And there has been students, there have been students that kind of let loose and then the graduate students will go back and tell the admissions committee or their PIs like, oh yeah, this student, like they seemed a little bit crazy. And, uh, you know, like that's worst case scenario. And at the same time, you don't have to be fake because like I mentioned, uh, these are the people you're gonna be interacting with for the next five to eight years. So hopefully you wanna actually, uh, like their company and get along with them. But it's, um, you kind of do want to think of the whole experience as still part of the interview to some degree, because of course, like your behavior is going to reflect on you, not only when you're in front of a professor or somebody in the uh, administration of the university, but also when you're with the grad students and all the other people that you meet. Yeah, one thing I'll note is that um, you might list, uh, say, like some professors that you want to meet with if it's applying to a program and that some of those professors might not be there or like the interview schedule may not make it so that you can meet with them. Occasionally, they will set up um, like a time, an extra time for you to be able to meet with that professor or though I think these days <laughs> Zoom is so prevalent that they would probably help you out. But the administrative staff that are sort of running the interview program can help to set up a discussion between you and professor if it's not possible for that um, discussion to occur during the time that you're say visiting a school for an interview so definitely like use the staff they are very helpful um, in most cases and, and happy to try to make it a good interview experience for you well one thing i want to uh uh, add on, uh, Andrea made a wonderful point that um, oftentimes the interview is extending beyond the formal time you're talking with professors. Um, and since Ross brought up the staff, we also we we also get information back from the staff, not only from the time in the weekend, but even in how you interact with them over email, <laughs> asking about the status of your application. Um, so always remember to do that in a polite and respectful and non-demanding way. <laughs> because it does influence how um, the overall application is received if we find out that like 50 emails were sent to the graduate, you know, program manager and some of them were, you know, a bit aggressive. So uh, it doesn't happen all the time, but occasionally we do have, you know, some outliers. Um, so I would just think through, especially, the, and the staff work really hard around the um, the grad programs. There's so much work to administer some of these programs. Um, so be be very kind to them, and, and we will appreciate that. It will make everyone's experience better. Yeah, to take that even one step further, we do we talk, we all talk very much so, <laughs> um, more than you would think, and we watch. So if you're in seminars or if there's speed lightning talks for your rotations from professors, I'm watching. Are you on your phone? Are you taking notes? Are you paying attention? Um, cause I want to know, are you teachable? Um, and that directly comes back to, you know, if you're playing chess on your phone or whatever else, when, you know, other senior members of the department or myself are giving a talk, 
I don't know that that's going to be the type of personality I want representing me in my lab or that um, is going to be teachable in the way that I would like you to be, that I can help you get to your career. It's one thing that I would like to add in terms of like the surprise element, something like that. Um, so when you get to the program and you are assigned to interview with a professor and you are like, you know, prospective students, if you list like the top three and you may have to list more than that and you get to interview with a PI or sorry, like the professor that you may not, you know, want to work with or not in the top three because of the scheduling, something like that, you should, you should be genuine and like talk with them as if they were the one you're going to be working with them because like 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 katie and Kathleen says that uh they talk with each other you know uh, <laughs> if you're like you show that like you're you're not you're pretty you're being like you know a little bit of disrespectful or um you know not care about the other research outside of your interest that's not what a pc student is supposed to behave honestly because there is a lot of collaboration that can occur um with your lab and like the, the lab that you are talking with so that that was something that um i was a little bit a little bit surprised when i when i get to like during my interview time at least like i was trying to um let's say i was trying to be very polite and like talk as if i'm gonna join the lab and they were just like tell tell me right away that, like i know that you don't want to join my lab but you know that what you should be doing right something like that and i feel like i sort of like surprised and also appreciate that they say that at the same time because like you know it's part of the interview process and and they, they're grading you um or like you know scoring you according to how are you going to be as a student yeah so to just kind of repeat this point maybe even one more time if I'm interviewing and I'm very interested in a candidate, then I will specifically kind of make sure that somewhere during their schedule, there's at least one or two other professors who I will then specifically get feedback from on that, um, as well as more broader terms. It's already been brought up, but if I'm at the point where I'm kind of close to making an offer to a candidate, then I, this is not like a process or something I do myself. I basically sit down with the whole lab and as a group, we basically discuss this out and I say, okay, this, you know, this is the candidate I'm thinking about. What are your thoughts? You know, at that point, I've already gotten feedback, but then we kind of talk as a group about literally everything. So it's not just, it's not just my decision, essentially. It has to be a good fit. Um, one other thing I'll add is just kind of be prepared for unexpected. I mean, my own interviews where, well, one in Europe and two ages ago, but I remember um when I interviewed in the lab I ended up in uh I got dragged multiple times by several graduate students to like a foosball table to play foosball games <laughs> so just be prepared for all sorts of things yeah awesome I think um I'd like to maybe jump off a little bit on what you were saying Kaylin on sort of interviews more directly with the lab. And I think this also goes to when you're maybe in the future, if you're doing rotations sort of directly kind of deciding which lab to join. Um, our lab is one, uh, the lab I'm currently in is one that does more direct admissions. We, we do occasionally have rotation students, um, but for the most part, um, a lot of Canadian universities do direct admit. And so I'd like to reiterate what Kayla said about how we will usually have a few people or um, more senior members of the lab that will get to meet with any prospective candidate to the lab after they've passed some sort of screening. In fact, right now, there's like a, a set of us that are sort of reviewing applicants and screening them. And so very much the case that people in the lab often are involved in making decisions about whether you're going to come for an interview or, or be admitted into the lab and so on. So make sure that you like really pay attention to people that you meet from the labs. Often you can learn a lot from grad students in a lab or in a program about what they think. So I don't know if it's been brought up or very much so far, but like definitely talk to the students at any program or lab that you're interested in, get as much information out of them as you can. And then that'll also reflect well on you as being sort of a curious, thoughtful person as well. Um, you know, you they want to see that you're thinking about more than just 
like do you think some paper that was recently published was cool but you know you're really thinking about multiple aspects of joining the lab and, and how you'll fit in um are there any other comments on direct admission things i i know it can be like quite a different process and so I want to leave it open for a second i will just jump in with one further thing which is you know maybe this is not as relevant at this point and at the interview stage but I would encourage everybody much earlier on to just reach out to the professor um, because there's many cases, for example, um, uh, I, I'm one of those where um, the lab takes in students from many, many different programs and the, the different things you're going to have to do, the different options, the different things the professor will be able to do for you, for example, as like a, maybe like a moving bonus or relocation cost or stuff like that can vary quite a bit. Um, so I've definitely had cases where, you know, I had a student that was interested in who applied through one program, but it would have been much better if they had applied through another. So I would encourage everybody to kind of reach out um, and, and look at that. Yeah, great comment. I think many of the people here have not necessarily applied to programs yet. So that's a great thing for people to look out for um, if you're if you're still sort of pre-interview or pre pre-application. Yeah, I would add to that. We we don't do direct admissions at all, I think, at MIT, or at least not within the, the biological engineering or chemical engineering or CSB. Um, but it's definitely true that there are certain programs that people are more or less likely considered to be a good fit for. Um, and so reaching out early can help you to know um, what your options are. Also, at MIT, you can apply to all, like, I mean, you can apply to, I think, it, all of the graduate programs <laughs> if you want to, um, the, whereas some places you have to choose like one or two or something. Um, so it, it can be like a matter of fit might be the right thing to try. Um, and yeah, so I think that that's, that's one thing that's useful. Uh, I now have a, a, a template though, because I do get a lot of like people asking for direct admit and then having to just direct them. Okay. If you're this person, go to this program. If you're this person, go to this program, because there's a lot <laughs> and we don't direct admit. So yeah, I was wondering, oh, Sarah, Caitlin, you can go first. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not as fast on the draw. <laughs> um, I was kind of a direct admit in a way. I had done a research experience for undergrads, and I wanted to bring that up uh, for folks that haven't applied yet, that are in the sophomore, junior, or wanting to take a gap year. Um, that's a powerful opportunity. There's lots of research experience opportunities during the summer, so you don't have to overlap with school, um, or you can potentially take research for credits. I used to teach undergrads all the time for a couple hours credit a week or a semester. Um, so if you're not sure you want to go to graduate school, do an REU. Um, they oftentimes pay really well. That's why I was interested. It paid more um, than working on the farm or working at the local fast food chain for me in the summers. Um, and the work that I did ended up getting me on a grant that funded my PhD so that I only had to teach half of the time um, and gave me more bench time. So those are really potent opportunities to flesh out what you want to do as a career. Because I didn't know what options I had in science other than being a high school teacher or going to medical school until I did an REU. Um, and that's really where I fell in love with research um, and genetics in the first place. So um, there's lots of options of like, pre-grad school things, I guess, to decide what you want to do and, and what areas you like. Yeah, definitely, definitely support the REU things. There's a lot of good ones out there. And uh, there, there's a lot of school dependent ones. We should have a whole panel on REUs. I know I've planned this before, but it's one I never got around to. Andrea, go ahead. Yeah, I want to add something real quick, because I'm not sure it'll fit in with the other questions that might get asked. Um, but on the rotation side of things um, and admissions, one thing I do think it's important to know is that if a school didn't pick you, it might not necessarily be because you are a bad candidate. It might just be that the current professors or lab spots that they have don't align with what you said you were looking for. And so it's, and it's very tricky because it's such a shame to not be able to bring on a new student just because, well, now that you're in this program, we don't have anywhere to put you and that's not a good situation for either the school or for you as a student. And so, yeah, I just wanted to make a point to mention, like, don't be discouraged, definitely um, be open in the schools that you apply to and be open in the labs that you're interested in. But if you don't get picked for a certain school, don't think 
it might be because you're not a good candidate. There's always the chance that it would have not been a good match for you. And so they, that's the reason they said no. Yeah. And if you screw up in an interview, you're human. I really admire when students, particularly this happens with medical students who are looking for, you know, partial credit, research credit. Um, they, they reflect on their interview or their time and they'll be, they'll feel like they fell short in some way or came off wrong. And then they'll email me and they'll say, Hey, I feel like I really screwed this up. Can we try again? I'm sorry. And like, I really respect when you recognize that um, you didn't do your best and I'm usually willing to give you a second shot um, cause you're only human and we all have those days. So. Okay. Didn't want to interrupt anybody as they got started. Okay. There's, um, uh, there's a question that's been brewing in my head as you guys have been talking about this. And I guess this would be more for like Caitlin, Katie, and Kaylin. Um, so if somebody is interested to work with you and they wanted to reach out, um, maybe they're going to have an interview, maybe they're thinking about applying to your program, what's the best way to get in touch? Should they email you? Are they gonna be able to talk to you? Are you gonna put them in touch with a student? Can they get in touch with the student? So many questions. Uh, that's a great question. So I will, I think email is the best way. It's also kind of awful. <laughs> So if you don't get here back from me within a week or two, try again. There's just certain waves of time when there's a deluge of email in my inbox and I, I, I just struggle to dig out. And it doesn't mean I'm not interested. There's plenty of things that I'm like, oh, I wonder what happened to that. I was like, did I respond to that? I was like, I saved it, but did I respond? Um, and so if you really want to talk to someone, follow up again, especially I think that's true with professors. Um, sometimes, you know, most often, like I'll try to give information about how to apply. Um, I do find a lot of people want to talk to me about research, which is which is good, but it's hard to set aside 15 minutes um, or even, you know, 15, 30 minutes just to talk about research all the time for perspectives. I'd rather talk to people when they're here and then just give them directions on how to apply. Uh, but if you catch me at a meeting, <laughs> you kind of have a captive audience. So there's things like that. So if you want to come to Mammalian Synthetic Biology Workshop in Boston, which is in August, I will be a very captive audience and I will come to your poster. <laughs> so that's uh, that's what I will say. I don't really have much to add to that. It's basically the exact same thing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, similar. Don't hesitate to send a, hey, just wanted to pop this back up to the top of your inbox. Um, I mean, include your CV, include your career goals. Those are always really good things because we do get a lot of spam emails. Um, so <laughs> it's important. It sounds super nitpicky, especially for my name can be spelled 18 bajillion different ways. But like one of the ways that I identify spam is, can do, do you know who I actually am? Are you addressing me as my title of doctor or are you, you know, addressing maybe one of my co-authors that isn't at this email address? Um, that's how you, we want to talk to you, but we're oftentimes not equipped with the time, like Katie was saying. Um, and I get a lot of spam. I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to tell sometimes what's real um, and what is automated spam. Don't bulk email every single faculty person in the department with a very vague email, because we've had that happen quite a bit from actual people who wanted to apply. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the advices, advice that I have for emailing professors, and of course you guys can correct me if this maybe would work with you or not, but I always try to keep the first email short and concise because they are receiving tons of emails from prospective students, their current students, maybe the class students and classes they teach. And so, right, the in inbox is full and if you start that first email with a full cover letter, you know, several paragraphs, it can be difficult at the time to read it. And so if you first start with a, hey, you know, like, of course, a formal, but like, hey, can we talk? I'm interested in your lab. And then once the professor replies back to you, then you can start giving them more information. At least that's, I don't know, a rule I tend to follow sometimes. That's a really great point. If it's too long, I'm like, Oh no, I can't just respond to this. 
<laughs> quickly. Um, what I really like is when people have like the like the TLDR in the top, and then then there's like a break, and it's like need more information, see below. And it's kind of like you see, so then I can get like the full. If I'm like, okay, they want to talk. What do they want to talk about? I'm like, okay, yeah, I see the resume. Okay, got it. I, you know, it's those are things that can be really helpful. I even break up emails like that to like senior faculty. <laughs> I'm like, I just need your signature. Here's why. <laughs> yeah, subject lines uh, are an art in and of themselves, <laughs> I think, in these these aspects. So never underestimate a short but thorough title of your email or subject line for your email to catch attention. All right, perfect. So we'll go ahead and open it up to the audience questions. Ice, if you had something to say while people are working up the courage to ask a question, go ahead. Um, you can either put a question into the chat, we will monitor it, and then we will ask the panelists, or you can feel free to raise your hand and then we'll call on you to go ahead and say what you wanna say. If people are shy, I have more questions um, that I can ask the panel. So Ice, why don't you go ahead? So um, since Katie mentioned that, um, you know, catching up the PI or uh, the professors at a conference is a very good chance that, that you will get their attention. Um, I want to add one, on one other thing that like, you know, if you go to the conference as an undergrad or like as a, um, a postback and you didn't see the PI, but you see the students from that lab, make sure you reach out and talk. Um, that will help you know better how the lab culture would be, how the school is you know, treating students from each program, like, you know, if there is anything that stand out from a particular program over the other program, then they can tell you, they they usually pretty honest about like, you know, what kind of, you know, differences program would be. Um, and you can also like, let them know that you're applying. And if, if the student knows you better, then they might be able to help you um, concur to the professors that like this student is reaching out and seems like a good fit for our team and they would read your email or they will find your email um, to, to respond back to you. And that, that's another uh, angle, I would say. Cool, okay, question from Denise. So what are the best questions to ask during interviews to understand the lab environment? I think uh, maybe um, part of that is to think about who it's good to ask those questions to. So I think a really good sign of a good graduate department is if during the admissions or interview process, they are pushing graduate students to talk to you. Because gen generally, if they're pushing graduate students to talk to you, that means that the grad students are going to have good things to say. So if you at all get the chance to talk to graduate students, um, that's... And in general, just ask them, hey, do you like the lab? What, you know, like, what is your advisor like? What, uh, what is the grad student life like? Just general questions. Usually they're more than happy to answer if they're, if they volunteer to be part of the interview process. Um, if you're in, if your interview process doesn't involve talking to grad students, if it's more just talking to um, professors, I think, um, I would say more just, ask about like what the nine to five would look like or ask about um, like um, you want to know how many people there are in the lab for example might be one of the things to consider so if it's a really big lab then that's going to look a lot the interactions are going to look a lot different than if it's a lab of two to three people that's just starting out and so consider things like size of the lab and maybe um, you can't really ask for about funding, but you know you want to you want to think of like little tiny details that maybe are not as obvious that could affect the lab environment. I can jump in with one thing. I would totally ask about funding, and I would kind of expect people to ask about funding. <laughs> in fact, uh, one of the things that I do is that if um, if graduate student candidates get far enough far enough along in the process and I essentially get to the point where I'm making them an offer and usually I will go forward and send them the grant that I've submitted and hopefully been funded that will that they will be working on or that has led up to the project that they will be working on 
And then so once they've read through that grant, then that can kind of build off of um, a variety of, of questions. Um, I guess more in general about lab culture. Um, yeah, just ask things like, how often, if you're talking to the students in that lab, how often are you able to meet with the PI? Like how busy is he? Um, and that obviously relates to the size of the lab. How easy is it to get help from others in the lab? Is it like a very kind of collegial teamwork type of um, environment? Are most of the projects very like individual or are you expected to kind of work amongst each other? Um, what do you do for fun? <laughs> uh, are there snacks? You know, things things like this. <laughs> we value, I feel like our lab culture revolves around food for whatever reason, but um, so you can, you know, there's a lot of little things you can ask uh, that will give you kind of an, a, a really good insight. Yeah, I would just add to that, that there's like, so there's like lab cultures are as unique as people, right? I mean, they, they, in fact, the, the composite of all the people in the lab makes what the culture is. Now, some people have stronger, uh, you know, influence and effect on that. Um, and, but I think that w when you join a lab, certainly it's going to be influenced by the PI, but it's really going to be strongly influenced by the grad students and postdocs and people that you interact with all the time. So getting to know them is really important, finding times to chat with them. I think it's also nice to find times to chat with people on one-on-one. -on -one. Um, that's important. Um, if you can never get a chance to talk to people on one on one, I feel like it, that's it's hard to really get straight answers from from folks because like, you know, people will tell you things more honestly if there's not somebody else watching them. <laughs> so it's uh, it's good uh, to do that. And and I'll say this, that, you know, professors can we can tell you anything. You we want. Oh yes, the lab is very friendly and collegial. Well, that might actually be our personal perspective. <laughs> <laughs> what it is we're not lying to you um but what the students are experiencing could be quite different right um and there's many reasons that could be like you know i'm completely maybe it's that i am as a pi completely oblivious to you know this annoying thing that i do and unless i happen to ask my students you know about it then you know i won't even know how to how to correct it now in practice i do try to ask my students like are the things working etc cetera, etc cetera. um and i think there's very few pis who go out of their way to be obnoxious but you know uh, it happens. So asking people what they like, what they don't like about their, you know, their grad experience. And I will say, you know, everyone's looking for different things in grad school. Like I know some people who they just want to go to lab where they can work like, I don't know, 20 hours every day. Like I literally do. They're across the street from me. Um, but uh, in, in my lab, it's not common. Um, and most people aren't looking for that. But those are labs that certain people thrive in. And you need to figure out what lab do you thrive in? Um, or will you thrive in? Um, so I think you, the only way to know that is to really talk to a lot of people. Yeah, I'll add really quick to that. Um, I think one some um, specific questions that might be good to get an idea um, of these kinds of things is asking if the PI is more hands-on or hands-off. Um, and that's not necessarily a good or a bad thing. That also depends on what you personally are looking for. Do you want somebody that's going to be, you know, in the lab every day or somebody that's going to be maybe at conferences all the time and you only talk with them once a, a month or something that really depends on what you think is best for you uh, for learning, I think. Um, and I think also asking the size of the lab, as I mentioned, is also important, right? But also the composition of the lab. So if it's mostly graduate students, but you want to get some mentoring in grad school, then you might want to ask, hey, do you usually take on any undergrads or do you do any summer programs? Or maybe the lab is mostly postdocs, in which case you can get an idea, okay, well, is your training going to be mostly done by the postdocs as opposed to the PI, which is a different kind of environment than if it's maybe only you as a grad student and your PI is the one that's going to directly train you. So those things, um, they're, they come down to more what you are looking for in a lab environment. Um, they're not necessarily better or worse but it, it does change what your education is going to look like. Awesome. Oh, Can sorry, you one more thing? Oh, yeah, I was just going to say, having conversations early and often about expectations and being very clear about those expectations are always helpful of, like everyone was saying, like, I don't adhere to a nine to five schedule and my research doesn't really adhere to a nine to five schedule, but I don't expect you to be working 24 hours. Um, as long as you're safe within whatever time frame you're working, you know, it, it really 
can depend lab to lab and, and some labs expect you to be there nine to five for collegiality and collaboration. And it's important to know what works for you and what's your style heading into that. Um, so I'm looking for, do you know that about yourself? Um, and are you able to ask questions towards that end? All right, perfect. So a few more questions to get to before we wrap up here. Um, Okay, so the first one is from Samantha. So Samantha says, basically, how do we balance sort of different kinds of undergrad experience? So for example, like one big experience versus several smaller or shorter experiences. Um, is there like a preference or, or maybe what's your perspective on students coming from these different backgrounds? I would like to add, um, you know, respond to to this kind of question real quick. So, um, I think it depends on 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 both ways. So it depends on both like whether how long you've been with the lab you were trained with, and also like how much have you contributed or how much have you learned through those experiences. So, um, you know, looping back to the interview focus a little bit, like you might be asked to explain what have you learned during your undergrad research, and that will explains a lot on what what you've done right like if you um, stay at the same place for three years but um, what you are explaining is you know equivalent to something that was like you know, like a, an REU kind of like um, summer research then that will reflect you know your experience right away um, so I would say it depends on the lab that you're applying for um, like you know um, Citing what Mona was asking um, in the next question as well, that like, are you likely to get in a lab that you are already volunteering in? So like, I would say that the labs will likely um, appreciate you who come with the right background to work in, you know, this specific project, but it's not necessary, right? So if you come with the right background, you um, you will expect to, you know, um, exhibit your um, your experience or like what have you learned in that uh, specific field as well um, the read interview or something like that oh, i'll stop right here just to not like spend too much time all right one to two other comments i mean if you had a a bad experience you, you still should frame it professionally um, and that's coming, I, I changed PIs during my graduate school experience and you need to frame it in a way that this is what I learned. Um, and sometimes what you learn is what you don't wanna do and who you don't wanna be. And those are just as important lessons as learning who you do wanna be <laughs> and what you do wanna be. And, and those are really important life lessons, I guess, in general, uh, that, it's okay if you had a bad experience. I think everyone on this panel can say that they've had a bad experience in this area. Um, that's valid. Your experience is valid and um, we understand on the other side. I would say part of the question, I know it says, it talks about consistency in research. And I think maybe the fear there is that if you switch around too much, maybe, um, you might, you think you might be giving the impression that you're undecided, but I think it's, you shouldn't, that shouldn't necessarily be a worry. Um, so there's going to be some places, for example, like if you're applying to a program that you're applying directly to a specific uh, lab, then in that case, of course, they're looking for you to be more um, narrow with your interests to some degree. So maybe they're looking for you to, um, to work on a specific project or in a specific area. And so in those cases, it does make sense to present yourself as, I know this is what I wanna do. Here are the reasons why I wanna do this. But if you're going into a rotation program and you go with that same approach, then they might start to think, well, we don't really have somewhere to put you. You seem very determined to be working in this field, but we only have positions for these other fields. And so they might pass you along where maybe you were more flexible than that. So, you know, it's depending on what kind of program you're applying to, you might want to phrase yourself as, or you might want to uh, put yourself forward as, I'm very, very narrow, this is what I want to do, or, but I'm also open to X, Y, Z, or I'm also interested in learning about, you know, ABC 
or whatever. I can add one last thing, which is that, um, at least from, from our perspective, we often want um, students that can work both experimentally and computationally. And it's, I feel like many bio biology and biochem programs aren't really doing a good job of teaching programming. And so if you, if you switch around and you can show that, you know, you were able to do like wet lab work and one thing, and then another one, it was like a computational program, uh, computational work that can be a very good indicator. Uh, and I know the number of labs, especially in synthetic biology, that are looking for people that can jump and do both at the same time is, is increasing a lot. And there's a mismatch, I think, with what many undergrads are learning. So there can be opportunities there and that can be one way to showcase that. I'm just going to piggyback on that because I think it, if this is okay, Ross, like I think this gets to Dia's question, which is like how That's much does the topic of your undergrad research actually matter? Um, you know, and are you looking for the same type of, you know, people who have the same skills? For myself, uh, the, the most transferable, transferable skill is tenacity and perseverance. <laughs> that is simply it. Um, the, like the, 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 the mental, uh, you know, mode that you can just be like, I will tackle this thing. I will work on this. I will work hard on it. Um, and I will find a way is the most transferable skill. Um, and actually at least, um, for me, I'm, I'm not necessarily looking for students who have been working on a specific topic. Um, uh, it's certainly useful. It tells me that they, they've tried something and they haven't ruled it out. Um, but I actually think that <laughs> people, uh, there's an opportunity in grad school to survey a little bit more broadly. And if nothing, uh, else, I actually think that students in the beginning risk too little in trying different opportunities. Um, and they should be a little bit more open to exploring. And so I think rotations are great um, for doing that. Um, and so again, I, I, my students, most of them didn't have any synthetic biology experience, any mammalian tissue culture experience before they joined the lab. Now a couple did, um, but to be honest, like <laughs> after about a year, everyone kind of equalizes really quickly. Um, and so I feel very confident if we can get our undergrads up to speed and by the time they leave us, we're sad, like they're like doing really awesome, uh, but we can definitely get grad students who are coming in, like, you know, to do very well with stuff. Um, and they have a much longer time arc, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so I, I think for, for myself, uh, you, you really, you're looking for people who are curious, motivated, and, you know, will work through the challenges. Cause no matter what you're, it's always going to encounter challenges. Um, that's universally true, no matter what project you work on. Yeah, perfect. Um, maybe I'll say one thing quickly to Mona's question. I think ICE, just want to make sure we get everybody here. So ICE already said something here. One thing I will say is that there's a sort of academic bias towards people from elsewhere in general. And this is at every level, undergrads going to different schools or different labs for their grad school, grad students going to different schools, programs, labs, et cetera, for their postdoc. Postdocs going to different schools, programs, et cetera, for their post, for their professorship. So don't be offended if your PI suggests or your like mentor in your lab suggests to go somewhere else. They're probably thinking about maybe what's best for you to like learn more things. Now, if you really, really like what you're working on um, and you want to do that, that's totally fine. And we won't say don't do it. Um, but, you know, there, there might be a bias against taking somebody that was an undergrad in the lab that might cause them to be more hesitant about bringing you on and it won't be anything about your ability it's just this sort of inherent academic bias to sort of get out there and explore and see different things and I think it, overall that's a very helpful system but it, it can be a little bit frustrating if you know you're trying to transition from A to B in the same place um, so I think it's good to be aware of okay and final question that we'll get to here is from Ben so the question is basically um what can you expect about a interview weekend versus a recruitment weekend or maybe not a weekend maybe it's during the week but whatever interviews versus recruitment what's the difference so i can i can um uh, add a couple quick things about that one thing for example in several of the programs that i'm involved in we do is that you go through usually virtual interviews you then get an offer and then you are brought in for a visit. And so by the time you're brought into the recruitment visit, you basically already got your offer. Um, 
it's really about the the school and the faculty and the PI and the students convincing you that this is of your different hopefully many different options this is the best place for you so it really depends if um when it is in the cycle if it's if you've got your interview uh, if you've got your offer in hand or not uh, and it can be I think quite different usually you know if you've already got your offer everybody's like relaxed and it's just a, it's a kind of a different experience I would say than if it's pre-offer let's say Yeah, the one thing only caveat. I mean, like it's 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 a lot more chill. You're in. I think people can be much more relaxed. Now, the one thing I'll add on to this is just because you're admitted to a program does not mean you're suddenly into someone's lab. So, we've definitely had experiences where people have come in um, and been very arrogant on weekends, and I'm like, well, good luck with whoever lab you join, because <laughs> you're not on my list anymore. Um, that's pretty rare still, uh, but it does happen. And so I would, I would consider that like, you know, it's, you should feel relaxed. Like you're accepted. We, we want to get to know you. We're excited about you being there. And we hope that you're excited to get to know other people around you, that you maintain the curiosity and the, you know, all those wonderful, you know, features that, and characteristics that we saw. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the worst thing you do is come in there and be like, I now own this place. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, just, just keep that on scale. Yeah, I'll oh, add one thing to that, which oh. is just real quick, Andrea, then I'll let you go. Um, a lot of like even interview weekends, if it's for a program, have a high admissions rate once you're at the interview. Um, so a lot of schools, it's over 50% or 80%. It can be pretty high. And usually the students that are not admitted are not showing a lot of interest in the program or as Katie said, can be coming off as quite arrogant. So I once heard a story about a student who said to an MIT bioengineering, biological engineering professor's face in an interview that they didn't think that biological engineering was real engineering. So just like, don't do things like that, <laughs> you know? Even if it's not an interview, even if it's a recruitment weekend. But Ross, did they get in? <laughs> I mean, I was just going to second, right, what both of you guys said of it's, I mean, if you're being flown out or you're being invited to physically visit the campus, then there's a really, really high chance that they are heavily considering you for admissions because, you know, the school is already spending money to have you visit, to book you a hotel, to buy you meals, all of that. And so at that point, don't take it too easy, but it's a very good chance that they are interested in you as a potential applicant. But right, at the same time, don't go to the other end, as they mentioned, because there have been instances, right, where somebody gets a little bit too comfortable or says like, oh, this is my safety school, which has happened. I've heard people say that, or, you know, they insult somebody, whether it's a grad student or a professor or say something offhandedly. And you start to make enemies before you even go into the school, um, which is not a good thing. And so, I mean, it's, I would say both the interview and the recruitment can be very similar in the sense that you can treat it a little bit as like, okay, I already passed the first big hurdle, which is just your uh, application, getting to the admissions committee and getting, you know, like a, a good look through and uh, the sec like the first pass. But yeah, still consider that you're still within the whole interview process, even if it's during recruitment, right? Because you, you maybe don't have a lab yet. And yeah. Great. So I think we'll end it there, 433. I'm sure people have other meetings and things to get off to. Um, so thanks to all the audience and to the panelists, especially for being here today, um, posting a couple of relevant links that the audience may find useful in the chat. Um, so as a reminder, this will be, this is recorded, it'll be put on the YouTube, so if you'd like to review it or send it to your friends, look out for that on EBRC's YouTube channel. Um, this is a production of the Engineering Biology Research Consortium Students and Postdoc Association. For more about us, I put our website link in the chat. Um, if you're currently a grad student, say a master's student, you can actually apply for SPA membership, so check it out in that link. Um, otherwise, if you're an undergrad, you can engage with us on our Slack, and we're happy to answer more questions on there. Um, big thanks to the rest of the outreach team. Um, it's not just us, but there's several other people helping out with these undergrad initiatives and panels. And so thank you to all of them. And finally, thanks to EBRC for their support. Um, 
And that's it. So thanks everyone. Recording over.